All right, good morning, everybody. Um, happy Friday. Welcome, as always, this week's AMS Some Sports Ultrasound Case Series presentation. Um, today, actually, before I introduce her, I don't know, I'll, I'll say this again at the end, just a quick housekeeping uh, note. This is our last presentation before AMSSM, before the meeting, and we are actually changing the, um, the next presentation date. So Dr. Dave Robinson was slated to schedule to present on um, April 8th, but that conveniently falls right in the middle of AMSSM, so I obviously did not plan that well. So we are going to bump that back to uh, the, the following week, which would be the 5th. So again, I'll I'll um, it'll be posted um, online as well. But just a just a quick note. All right. So uh, so today we are fortunate to have Kira Novikovsky. She's um, actually either fortunate for, oh, very fortunate for us, maybe unfortunate for her. She is our fellow. Um, she's on the home stretch here. Um, she's got a family medicine background, and she is one of our um, rock star fellows here. So she is going to be giving a talk on some lateral knee uh, pathology, specifically a uh, distal IT band versopathy. And with that, Kira, you can take it away. All right. Thank you for that introduction. I think was a little too generous, but thank you. All right. Okay, hopefully you guys can see my shared slides at this point. Yep, looks good. Perfect, all right. First off, I just want to um, give a big thank you to Dr. Ryan Cruz and the AMSSM for the opportunity to present today. So today we're going to be talking about um, the lateral knee and specifically for this case, looking at an IT band versopathy and friction syndrome. So the obligatory disclosure side, no financial disclosures. And the basic outline for today is that we're going to be looking at this case of a cross-country track athlete, um, high school athlete, who's having knee pain that was diagnosed clinically as IT band syndrome, and then she wasn't improving, so she later had an ultrasonic diagnostic evaluation of her lateral knee. So again, going through the case, then looking at our lateral knee anatomy before going through our the scanning protocol and our images, and then discussing our case. So case intro, we have a 17 year old female high school cross country and middle distance track athlete. She began having chronic left lateral knee pain. And this began last spring during the middle of track season. She was running daily at that time. She presented about four months after her initial onset of pain. And at that time she was diagnosed with IT band syndrome. She then went on for three months of rehab. Um, however, she did not have any improvement um, despite her rehab. So she returned to the clinic for repeat evaluation. And at this time she was sent off for a diagnostic ultrasound. That brings us to going through lateral knee anatomy, looking mostly focused at the AMSSM structures and we'll kind of walk through that here. So specifically for lateral knee anatomy, um, with the particular scanning protocol, um, I'm going to include the lateral or the patellar ligament, um, even though this is an anterior, typically an anterior knee structure, just for more of guidance for how one can approach the lateral knee um, scan, especially when they're learning. Um, so the patellar ligament, then the IT band, uh, which is a um, broad band that inserts on Gertie's tubercle of the lateral tibial plateau and does have some other smaller insertional regions as well. And this is mostly made up of collagen. Then we'll move on to the Tibular collateral ligament or the lateral collateral ligament, so the FCL or the LCL. This is a more tubular cord like structure um, that has an origin near the lateral epicondyle and inserts near the anterior lateral fibula. Then we'll move on to the bicep femoris tendon. And um, here, this uh, tendon's primary insertion is on the lateral fibular head. Um, we can also have some. Um, different anatomic variation with its as well. 
So this gives us another view of those structures um, with the IT band having um, most of its insertion on Gertie's tubercle down here, um, looking at the FCL or the LCL, and then the biceps femoris tendon. We'll also look at the lateral meniscus, the papilidus, and going through then the um, AMSSM the lateral knee protocol. This is pulled straight from um, Hall's paper that was um, published digitally last year and then came out in paper this year. Um, so these are not in the specific order um, that I'll be presenting the imaging today, but looking at the IT band, the lateral recessive knee, the meniscus of what you can visualize with the ultrasound, the tibia femoral joint space, or the main knee joint, the um, LCL or the FCL with dynamic testing, the biceps femoris tendon, Lydius, the um, lateral patellar femoral joint, and then the proximal tibiofibular joint with stability testing, and lastly, the common fibular nerve. So how we can approach the lateral knee scanning, and especially when learning the scan, is to start with the Z scanning pattern, which is where that patellar ligament comes in into of this uh, lateral knee scan that we can start with a patellar ligament and then basically move in that same plane posteriorly, um, although it looks a little bit off kilter here, but mostly posteriorly to the IT band. Um, we can palpate that lateral um, femoral condyle and then um, down to Gertie's tubercle to get our IT band into picture. Then we can basically pivot the transducer. So we rotate basically locking in that proximal end of the transducer and then rotating down to the fibular head to get the FCL or the LCL into view. And then lastly, locking in on that fibular head and then rotating the proximal end of the transducer to get the biceps femoris. Now, when going through this particular scan pattern, um, so you get that Z. This, if you maintain that same transducer position, you would be in long axis over the structures at all times. So that is one, you could say a downfall of doing the specific Z scanning and moving that specific pattern. So through the presentation today, even though I'll maintain this overall pattern, I will deviate at times to show the images in short axis and then to show some of the adjacent structures. Then putting this um, into practice um, with one of our fine um, uh, athletic trainer students that let me take this video, um, we can see the um, Z scanning maintaining all lateral or long axis views going with the patellar ligament first, now over the IT band. And then we're gonna lock that proximal end, rotate the distal end to the fibular head to see the LCL. And then we're gonna lock this distal end and then rotate up to then see the biceps femoris. So then this can move on into our images. So when looking at our images, which this is our, um, very uh, kind athletics uh, training students that let us take these images. This is his knee. These are not um, the um, our case um, images of me. So we first again can start in that patellar tendon ligament to help orient ourselves for the scan. So this is the more proximal end of the patellar ligament, and then we can move distally. And again, this is more for the anterior knee, but for sake of that Z scanning pattern, we'll look at the patellar tendon. And um, trying to get the whole patellar tendon as much of that in view as possible. We can rotate on the patellar tendon to see it in short axis. And then this is where we would move on to that lateral knee scanning protocol and look at the IT band. However, for the purposes of this case, just because this is going to be the main point of the case is looking at the IT band, we're going to go through the rest of the knee protocol first and then come back to the IT band at the very end of the case. So 
If we go back to the disease scanning protocol, we would move from the patellar tendon to the IT band, and then we would move to the lateral collateral, tubular collateral ligament. So here we can um, appreciate the LCL here, this nice fibrillar structure, and we can see that it's inserting onto the fibular head here. So this is looking more at the distal aspect of the LCL. And then we can work our way proximally, and maintaining that nice fibrillar structure. And then we can see it start to insert onto the, near the uh, femoral epicondyle. So here's a video um, just at rest uh, without any dynamic testing of us working our way from proximal to distal of that LCL trying to maintain that fibrillar structure. And um, one of the challenges that I think we all recognize is trying to maintain that structure in, in plane, and um, especially with the LCL being more of this tubular cord-like structure that it's easy to fall off the LCL. Um, and I, sorry, one other thing that I didn't mention earlier with the patient positioning, um, not to jump back to that, but you notice that we have him side lying and then we have a pillow under his uh, knee to help put that knee into the varus position so then we can put those um, tendons and ligaments a little bit more on stretch just so we can see a little bit better appreciation of the integrity of the ligaments and tendons. So then if we want to really test the LCL, we're going to put various stress on the ligament, and then we'll look to see if there is any um, increased distance. And here, so we can find overall, look at just the LCL, the fibular collateral ligament is intact without evidence of tear and overall. So this is where we're deviating slightly from that Z-scan pattern, looking at the lateral meniscus. So here we can see the posterior horn, that triangular structure. And then we move it slightly anteriorly where we can see that blue line. Uh, we can see the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus. So then the findings, and I'm presenting the findings here for um, as many of the structures um, as possible that are in the complete scan. So we see the visualized portion of the lateral meniscus is normal without evidence of large peripheral tear or perimeniscal. Then um, we can also rotate our transducer again and appreciate the patellofemoral joints, looking at the patella here and the femur. And moving on, we can then um, continue on with our Z um, scanning protocol where we are on the LCL and we've now rotated our transducer where we've locked in that proximal or distal end and we rotate the proximal end to um, focus our attention to the biceps femoris tendon. Here we can see that inserting onto the fibular head and we can see that nice fibrillar structure. And then we can move proximally to see the myotendinous junction. And here's a video working from proximal to distal. And we can see that insertion onto the fibular head. We can rotate on the biceps femoris to then look in short axis. And here we can see the report for the biceps femoris as being tendon is normal without evidence of tendinosis or tear, and there's normal myotendinous junction. While we're in the region of the biceps femoris, we can then have our transducer. Um, in a essentially short axis to the biceps femoris to appreciate the tibiofibular joint. So here we can see the fibula here, our joint space here. And then we can look for dynamic testing to see if there's any instability of that joint by providing stress to the fibula, seeing if there's any movement of that joint. Well, down in this region, we also evaluate the common fibular nerve. And here we do not see any evidence of um, swelling or loss of the honeycomb structure. So here we appreciate that the common fibular nerve is normal. Um, for the purposes of this scan, I did come back um, proximal to then appreciate the popliteus. So here we can come over the um, lateral 
um, femoral condyle, and we can appreciate the popliteus and short axis in the popliteal um, recess here. And then one of the challenging things about the um, popliteus to visualize this in short axis is it does wrap around the posterior knee and insert on the tibia that when we rotate the transducer, we have to appreciate that the popliteus is going to dive down and have this curve as we can see. So it's difficult to maintain this entire tendon in um, uh, without having some um, uh, anisotropy. So with the popliteus, our final report with the popliteus is the tendon is normal without evidence of tendinosis or tear. So now that we've looked at most of the lateral knee, we can move back to the IT band that we talked about initially. So I want to first present examples of normal IT band. So here we can see the IT band um, crossing the joint space. We can see the femur proximally, and then we can see um, the beginning of the tibia distally, and then um, we can see, as if we're more proximal, we can see that IT band crossing over the femoral condyle. And we can also appreciate the region where we could have potential compression. And here's the video of the IT band in long axis moving from proximal to distal. So we can appreciate where the IT band is beginning to insert on Gertie's tubercle. Then if we rotate our transducer, we can appreciate the IT band and short axis um, over that uh, lateral femoral condyle. So moving back to our case images, we can see already with her um, uh, IT band and long axis or lateral femoral condyle, we're already appreciating a thickening compared to the previous images that we saw. And we are also seeing this or um, hypoechoic region here, um, deep to that um, fibrillar structure. So we're starting to already see concerns of fluid in the bursa. Then if we rotate the transducer to short axis, again, we can appreciate this thickening of the IT band, and we can also appreciate that we're seeing the swelling of the bursa. We're seeing this more um, hypoechoic signal and um, that we're appreciating, um, uh, again, this thickening. Here's another image to look at that IT band and short axis and looking at that fluid that's in the bursa. Now, if we look at flow, and we're looking at um, uh, microvascular flow, that we can appreciate that there's subtle signal within the IT band, which we would not expect to typically see. So this would also be a suggestive of um, edema um, within the IT band, which would lead to that swelling, that thickening that we're appreciating. We can look at the thickness of the fluid with the bursa, being very careful as to not displace the fluid by when we are placing our transducer over region of potential fluid and swelling. So we can see that she has this fluid of almost 0.2 centimeters. And so then that brings us to our final report with the IT band. So we can see that there's slightly thicken across the lateral femoral condyle. It is normal as an insertion onto the tibia. And then we again see this hypoechoic thickening and free fluid within the IT band bursa. We did not have the videos here, but when performing live dynamic exam, we can see that that bursal tissue um, compresses um, and with the flexion and extension of the knee, which also reproduces those symptoms. So if we go back here again, being cautious to think about how easily we could displace this fluid too um, with our transducer, and thinking about how the IT band functions um, in extension and flexion 
um, and that we can see different compression with the IT band. So again, reviewing our other structures that so we already looked through the report and looking at abbreviated that um, our other structures were normal. Um, we did not see a knee joint effusion, which is also important, which we'll get into that in a minute here. And then overall, um, that the findings were consistent with iliotibial band friction syndrome and uh, bursopathy. I just want to talk about IT band bursopathy and friction syndrome briefly. So we look at particularly friction syndrome is the cause of lateral knee pain in 62% of female runners and 38% of male runners. Um, so there's different proposed theories as to the etiology of why um, friction syndrome occurs. We think of this as being um, often over the femoral condyle where there's compression of fat and connective tissue that's deep to that IT band. Um, and then we can appreciate um, that there is a mean thickness of the IT band um, if we're looking across healthy individuals. Um, that typically we see the thickness of the IT band about 1.1 to 1.9 millimeters. And then as we move distally, we will expect to potentially see the thickening of the IT band. So what are we looking for when we are evaluating for bursopathy and friction syndrome or other pathology of the IT band? Well, we're looking for swelling and edema, and such as our case, we did see that microvascular flow within the IT band. We're looking for a fluid collection um, that we saw also in our, our case. And then we're looking for cortical regularity at the femoral epicondyle, which we did not have in our case. Um, of note though, that thickening is inconsistent. So you can have a patient potentially with um, friction syndrome that does not have thickening of the IT band. So being cautious to remember that, um, that even if your IT band does not have that thickening, that that does not rule out that they have IT band friction syndrome. Tried to bring up a couple extra points too as well as that 3% of asymptomatic individuals will actually have um, bursal fluid within their IT band bursa. Um, so seeing this, um, it does not uh, definitively indicate that they have a bursopathy. And then um, the other caution that we noted that this patient did not have a knee effusion, but that lateral recess does extend adjacent to the lateral femoral condyle, um, and which is deep to the IT band, and that can potentially be mistaken as a bursopathy. So here we can see an example from this um, uh, 2020 article of a knee effusion under the IT band, which is marked with arrows, um, which one could potentially mistake for bursopathy. So just being cautious that, um, uh, about a knee effusion. So for our case then, um, with her diagnosis of the IT band bursopathy and friction syndrome, she did proceed with um, ultrasonic guided debridement um, of both the, um, of the bursal tissue and then also a percutaneous lengthening um, for her treatment plan uh, followed by PT rehab um, to get her back to running. So I um, just wanna summarize then um, for lateral knee, um, so a patient scanning. So first we need to think about positioning them so that side lying with the pillow between the knees to put the um, various positioning um, to help with the imaging of the um, ligaments and tendons and also getting positioning the lateral joint space to visualize the meniscus. We can start with the Z-scan pattern that we reviewed just to really help um, familiarize um, getting that pattern of finding the different structures, particularly in long axis. And then for our particular case, we saw that this individual had the IT band bursopathy and friction syndrome. So big takeaways are evaluating for edema, fluid collection, cortical regular, irregularity, and then possible thickening of the IT band. But knowing that we have um, that can be inconsistent and then being cautious about any effusion being mistaken for bursopathy. Um, so with that, these are my references. And then um, I just want to give a thank you to several people who helped me get this talk ready and um, offered um, me for some normal images. 
um, that would be Jennifer Ferdin, and then Pete, who is our fantastic athletic training student who, um, let me take that video, and um, I'll give a shout out to my fiance who, who I asked a lot of questions and had him be reviewed. Um, and then any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, I think we're told to have five minutes and we got four minutes. So try to keep it right on time. All right, great job, Kira. And to be fair, we started a minute late. So you're actually, you're actually spot on and right on time. So, so I'll take the blame for that one. Um, yeah, great, great job. I thought that was, you know, a, a, a perfect overview, you know, of, of lateral knee structures and you did it, which again is the whole, you know, kind of purpose of this case series in a very protocolized fashion. So, so well done there. Um, I just have a couple points uh, that I'll make quickly. Uh, <clears throat> you made a good point about, about fluid within the lateral recess of the knee versus in the IT band burst. I think that's very easy to confuse those two, you know, if you're not um, diligent uh, in terms of what you were looking at in the lateral knee. So, so don't confuse the two. And, and, and similarly, you know, you had a picture in there of, of your injection <laughs> when you're injecting, you know, injecting the IT band versa is, is obviously very different than injecting too deep. And then you're in the lateral knee and you lose your, you know, therapeutic and potentially diagnostic injection. So very two different regions. So, so uh, good job making that point there. Um, just a quick point on, on your image. So of, of your, of your um, uh, IT band bursa, at least to me, it looked like most of that was, was just a demodus, you know, boggy hypoechoic bursal thickening. And, and certainly there is some fluid in there, but I think a lot of that is just thick bursa, um, which, you know, obviously those, those go hand in hand. Um, but that's a, that's a, that's a good image there. When, when I'm looking at the IT band laterally, I, I think that there are two most common sites of pathology, you know, I'll, at least in my practice and in my eyes, I tend to see more pathology as the IT band crosses over the lateral femoral condyle. It's obviously a friction point and, and we can see thickening and bursal um, <clears throat> edema and fluid there, but also distally down at Gertie's. Um, I think it's just, it's important to look at both of those because they are, they are two um, potential points of pathology there. Um, you mentioned about putting the patient in as much varus as possible. That's especially true. You know, if you're, if you're imaging FCL, you know, if they're not in, you know, enough varus, we've all seen that where you've got this kind of saggy loopy FCL that's really hard to image and um, <clears throat> really getting them into a, into quite a bit of varus, which it looks like you probably had Pete into fairly uncomfortable amount of varus there. So sorry to Pete and, and good for you for getting good images there. Um, Popolidius, you mentioned that, you know, I will start laterally <clears throat> like you did um, and start my evaluation there. But I, I personally like to do the rest of the evaluation with them prone from the posterior approach. So, so I agree, you know, I'll take a quick peek laterally, but if clinically applicable, I will uh, flip them over to prone and finish my exam there. Um, and then the, the last thing, you know, when, um, if, when I'm looking at the lateral knee recess and then the, the lateral meniscus, you know, you certainly could, if clinically applicable, again, which is the whole point of the series to, to do this in a protocol manner, um, <clears throat> you could look at meniscal extrusion. So if I do have concerns for meniscal pathology and, and, and I want to dynamically evaluate that, you know, I'll, I'll put the patient in differing, you know, degrees of flexion and extension looking for um, for extrusion there. So that's just something else to, to consider, um, again, if, if clinically applicable. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's, that's what I have. Um, Dr. Hoffman. Yeah, um, Kira, well-organized, well-articulated, um, as we would expect from Iowa. Um, I guess I have three points, mostly to dovetail on Ryan's comments. So, First point is, and I've, I've mentioned this before, but it's a rare protocol of mine that does not start with the joint. And so my lateral knee protocol actually starts with the anterior synovial recess or superpatellar recess. And obviously looking for an effusion and thickening of the superpatellar synovial recess. And so when we talk about the lateral recess, potentially fluid confusing an adventitial bursa, 
obviously, if someone has a knee effusion and has thickening of the recess, we start to think about interarticular pathology. And so my anterior knee protocol um, is a little, is more expanded um, than my anterior views, let's say for my lateral or knee protocol, but that's where I tend to start. So if I'm doing a lateral ankle, I'm still starting on the anterior talocrural joint, same with elbow. Um, and so that's just what I've morphed into because I guess in my view, I think knowing that there is an effusion or a potential chronic interarticular process influences structures medially laterally. Um, Kira, do you have any tips um, about distinguishing um, an adventitial bursa from fluid in the lateral recess? I know the image that up is obvious in the sense as you can see um, the lateral recess coming from the interarticular space and then see a separate uh, adventitial bursa, but sometimes, you know, there's a fair amount of fluid there. So any tips that you have? I think as you pointed out, evaluating first if there is a knee effusion, which we did not show with here, um, uh, looking at the anterior um, uh, recess. Um, but I think potentially seeing how far approximately that fluid um, goes is, is helpful just because we wouldn't expect, um, we could potentially see the bursa a little bit uh, farther proximal than um, the uh, an effusion, um, but I'd also like to hear what your thoughts are too. Yeah, so a couple of things. One is uh, the plane that the fluid is in. So again, this really nice image that you have up, you can see that the plane is next to the lateral uh, femur in the epicondyle. So that would be a lateral recess versus that you see soft tissue, both deep and superficial to um, an adventitial bursa. Also, um, if you put someone in various stress, for example, which you talked about, that's gonna squeeze out a little fluid and also flexion and extension would typically change the fluid in a lateral recess where it wouldn't necessarily change as much fluid in an adventitial bursa because it's just contained to that space. So those are, those are some tricks that I do to help distinguish between the two. Um, my second point is it just, um, you know, the ultrasound of IT band uh, friction syndrome. And, you know, this is a great case, but my, my experience has been that sometimes this can be really subtle. And the patient comes in and, and is having classic symptoms of IT band friction syndrome. They're tender over the lateral femoral epicondyle. And you, in your initial ultrasound evaluation is, hmm, I'm not sure I see something. And so sometimes, and at least in my experience, is more common just to see some subtle thickening um, of the IT band rather than an adventitial bursa. Um, and <clears throat> it's not unusual in runners to see some underlying irregularity of the femoral epicondyle as a normal finding. So for me, the point is I carefully look at contralateral uh, images and look for some subtle differences and looking for that hypochoic thickening of the IT band. And with microvascular flow these days, sometimes you can pick up some subtle flow within the uh, IT band itself. Um, so at least in my experience, it's sometimes not quite as obvious. Um, and in this case, uh, just a, probably a picky comment, but it, there's there's a fair amount of thickening of that adventitial bursa there. So for me, that looks like a chronic adventitial bursa more than an acute. And I think Ryan alluded to that in a sense that the, the thickening of the walls is probably why there's not as much fluid in there. And so it would probably be okay if you see that to put in your report, uh, chronic appearing uh, <clears throat> IT band, you know, findings consistent with I, chronic appearing IT band friction syndrome. Um, and then the, the third point I want to make is that I find that ultrasound is really useful for lateral knee pain. So as we all experience, sometimes lateral joint compartment osteoarthrosis can be uh, very different than medial compartment arthrosis in the sense that it's oftentimes not focal medial, let's say, knee pain that we see with medial, but with lateral, they can have pain that radiates down the leg. It, it can be behave very differently and be a challenge. And radiographs sometimes can underestimate uh, the fact that there is some lateral compartment. I've even seen MR sort of underestimate that. But ultrasound of the lateral knee can be very helpful 
at that you can see some thickening of that lateral recess. You see some early marginal osteophytes um, of the lateral joint, and you see some degenerative meniscal changes. And sometimes you can pick those up uh, earlier than an MR if they're peripheral. And then they're also sore there. And so I I found that ultrasound can be really helpful at times for distinguishing some sort of nondescript lateral knee pain, particularly let's say in a older person um, that you know that radiates down to the calf. And I and I've discovered this just by the fact that a lot of these patients are referred to look at the common fibular nerve. And the common fibular nerve looks okay, but then I, I find these constellation of findings, and then we go ahead and do a ultrasound guided intraarticular injection and their, and their pain gets a lot better just to confirm that. So I've just found in general, um, the IT band uh, or just a lateral knee exam can be really helpful in these cases. And then just my last comment, the times that I've seen distal IT band most commonly is after knee arthroplasty. Um, and, and they can have bony projections because oftentimes it, Gertie's tubercle is near that interface between native bone and prosthetic and therefore you get some bony overgrowth. And, and it almost always looks abnormal after a knee arthroplasty, but then if they have pain exactly in that location with sonopalpation, then you've hopefully made that diagnosis. So those are my two cents. Again, this was a really well-organized and these images are fantastic. I, I, like I said, I typically don't see something this great. So nice job. Thank you very much for your comments and, and recommendations. It's very helpful. All right. Yeah. Great, great job, Kira. Like I said, you did a really fantastic job. So well done. And thanks for presenting. And, and as always, you know, Doug, thank you for the 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 pearls, the expert pearls. That, that's those are so helpful for all of us. So thanks for sharing that. Um, all right. So that's that. Like I said at the start, um, we're taking a bit of a of a break here because of AMS December or back on the 15th of April. Like I said, Dave Robinson is gonna talk about a case of distal um, intersection syndrome at the forearm. Otherwise, happy Friday, happy weekend. Everybody have a good one. Hope to see some folks, um, some real life humans at AMS SM, hopefully. And uh, we'll see you guys later.